Uh, continue meeting, yes. Uh, good day for every one of you. First of all, I'm not a professor of anything. I'm a learner who learned during his life Incidentally, or by chance, or by the will of God, I was brought to the humanitarian field. I was not a specialist of anything. Even I was a, يعني, not a first class doctor, medical doctor, second class medical doctor. I got all my degrees with pass or just good. Very, very few, very good marks. So whoever tells you that he is excellent and made the record, don't say this about me. I always fail before I succeed. And this is where I came from. I keep trying. Uh, so moving from the medical field to the humanitarian field was uh, a mere coincidence by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whom he guided me to do that. We didn't have any budget, any plan, any strategy. Anything of anything. I am the anything man or the nothing man who managed to become the something man. Then, because he came from a country called Egypt, and in Egypt, everybody claimed that they can do anything and everything, I became the everything man. So, from the nothing to the something to the everything. But go back to the nothing man. Nothing does not stop you from doing anything. Does not stop us from trying, from succeeding. When we started 37 years ago, we didn't have any budget, as I mentioned. We didn't have any office, any plan, any strategy, any of the any's that you talk about nowadays. And you put them as the hurdles. Unfortunately, young people, like Rosanna and all of you said, we cannot start unless we have. When we started, we did not have. And this is where you keep letting the snowball to roll down the mountain to try to make the greatest impact in the valley or on the valley. But it starts as a very small snowball. Uh, this is how I started. My experience, alhamdulillah, I'm a social worker. I learned by traveling, by reading, by communicating, by listening, by loving the sector that I'm trying to represent. Okay? So this took me nearly 37, 40 years. The birth of my, of my humanitarian response came in 1982 when I was visiting Bosnia for the first time when Bosnia was one piece and a part of Yugoslavia to discover the atrocity happening to the Muslim minorities in Bosnia at that time and the imprisonment of somebody called the late Alia Ezebegovic at that time from young students who were actually studying medicine and uh, engineering there. This was for me like an eye opening before I started working towards, uh, with my colleagues towards building Islamic Relief. 1982 was another incident as well, which was in Syria, Sahama. Big massacre happened at that time, which was an eye opening for me. And nobody was reporting it heavily. The third one was a cruel massacre in, uh, in Lebanon, in Sabra and Chitila camp. It was incidentally reported by a French uh, news reporter and went all over the place. So from Bosnia to Syria to Palestine, which is a Palestinian camp, come back to 
catch 22 after nearly 40 years is still happening. Bosnia is not settled. Syria is still on. Uh, what is happening? Suffering. And today is the 10th anniversary. That's why Sister Razan is wearing the black dress. Today, you need to read my article, which I sent it to Sister Razan, which has been published in the US. What, what is the name of the? In the US policy, foreign policy, uh, today on the 15th anniversary. And Syria is still suffering. Yemen is still suffering. Uh, you go the Rohingya and the others. So these 40 years started with Middle East as well as with uh, East Europe at that time. So we lived through all those agonies. We saw massacres, so we heard of rapes of young children, even at the age of four in Bosnia. We heard of slaughtering, throat cutting, and burning people alive. And we lived through this, unfortunately. This is, was um, some of the source of knowledge that I gained at that time. But you have to keep uh, optimistic. Uh, to keep optimistic and to keep learning and acting, connecting, communicating, and building partnership. Why I'm talking to you today, young people, uh, is because I want you to base your uh, future work on building partnership, which I call it A HOPE. Alternative, the acronym, A HOPE is an acronym of Alternative Humanitarian Operational Partnership Engagement. If I go to India, to any part of the Chanti town in India, in maybe in Madras or in Calcutta or in Delhi, I will, I will ask everyone to build the partnership on operational engagement with the local community. The wealth of knowledge of the local community is incredible. They learn by looking. They learn by listening, and they learn by suffering and sharing the agony. So they have a wealth of knowledge. If we can translate into action, we'll be able to find solution to those people, which sometimes in India call them. I'm not sure if this is the right term knowledge nowadays or not. I'm not sure if the brother from India will, uh, will, uh, will accept what I'm going to say, or this is an old terminology. The untouchable, is it still used? You can put in the chat, I'm wrong or I'm right. This is happening to different yeah, countries. Yeah, it's called untouchable. But they still, 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 still it calling it. It's illegal, but it's still practiced. Yeah, I was, OK. Thank you, sister. Thank you. Thank you. I like the Indian accent very much, as well as the Malay accent, as well as the Syrian accent, as well as my accent and any other accent. So coming back to this, Learn from the local community. You know how to learn from the local community? Sisters and brothers in the room. Is uh, your back to them. Uh, and by connecting yourself to them. The first step of building partnership is when you build partnership. Dr. Hani. Yes, okay. Yeah. Can you see me now? Okay. It's building partnership with the local communities, with what people call them beneficiaries, but they're not beneficiaries. The beneficiaries are the people who claim that they are helping them because they are holding their assets, their money, and spending it on them. So this is my introduction to you, unless you want me 
to answer some of your questions, or unless you want to make some comments, because I don't want to take the time or all the time just to deliver a lecture. I am a very simple learning, still learning, and Razan is teaching me by the day. Inshallah. Thank you. Um, well, doctor, if I may ask, because this is something that I always think of, which is going to a local community that you are not exactly aware of its details of their lifestyle and then working with them on some humanitarian uh, projects. Like, do you think that someone who's coming from outside the context of their living would be able to actually, you know, attend their, their needs? and what they are looking for in that local community. Okay. I think if you want to go, say, we'll make the example of India, in certain area of India, you have to read about it. You have to have the knowledge. Then you have to have uh, a partner to take you by the hand. Then when you go there, you have to observe their culture, okay, their values their morality, their religion, and their etiquette and their manner. Before doing anything, you might be from a different religion, from a different culture, having a different value. But you, you don't ever look at any local community from top down approach. Never, never. I have an acronym which I want you to write, Sister Razan which is uh, partnership, no, not partnership, tree. There's a tree and there is another one called uh, fat kiss. F-A-T, if you can put the, the wording uh, vertically, F-A-T, F, fundraising, A, advocacy or advocate, T is training. The second word, kiss, it is K for knowledge-based, I is innovative, S is sustainable, S solution. And this is the relationship between you, the sister from India, and maybe somebody else from Los Angeles or from London or from whatever it is. The one, and both of them should be treated equally. What I have is equivalent to what you have because those people coming from rich countries have to get the fund, fundraise for me, to advocate for me, and to train me because they have the know-how. For me, my role is to provide them with the partnership, sorry, with the, with the knowledge-based, innovative, sustainable solution. And my knowledge is equivalent to your money and your skills. And this is where you come together and in a very... Uh, very subtle way and showing your humility. People in different parts, in India or in the jungles of Malaysia, uh, can observe you and listen to you by their eyes. So don't go to them wearing these flashy dresses that we are wearing in the West or in a very rich country, or the big boots, or the whatever you call them, to make a barrier between you and them. Let them to feel that you are part of them. Even if you have a colleague of you taking you by the hand, they still will focus their eyes on you, on everything in the action, in the code of dress, in the way you talk, in the way you sit, in the way you eat, and, and try to get the knowledge or learn the knowledge about the people before you travel. Not because you have the money that you go there any, any time without making nonsense and saying something which is nonsense for them because you don't know their culture. Here, you start to open their mind before opening their hearts. Okay? Is it clear? That's very clear. Thank you. This was very insightful. Um, we are now opening the, the platform for you guys to share with us 
your comments, your questions, or maybe even if you want to reflect on your own experience. Um, I think most of the attendees today uh, have worked uh, in the humanitarian field. Uh, so please feel free to share with us, feel free to use Arabic or English. Um, we, we would like to, to hear from you and we would like you to, to benefit from the experience of Dr. Hani. Yeah, go ahead, Jawad. Um, hello, Dr. Hani. Thank you for uh, being here today. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm pleased to meet you. Um, I want to ask something like, it's, it might be generic, but I want to ask it, about it. You, you say that you started with uh, like anything and then you became something and then you became like somehow everything. And uh, you say that you failed so many times before achieving anything. I wonder, uh, I, I know that this is uh, somehow uh, a cliche question and so many people ask it, but I think that when you face uh, this question in your personal life, it becomes uh, a little bit different. Like... Uh, many people start uh, their projects or their dreams with uh, with a strong desire, and uh, and actually they always fail. Yani. I I mean like not every not everybody who tries a lot they uh, they succeed at, at at the end. Yeah. So what do you think? Like you, you said we started with no like strong foundations and uh, you could somehow build something uh, that's remarkable. So what do you think that uh, uh, yani helped you do that? So I would okay. like to hear some. First of all, you have to love what you do. Okay. That's number one. Number two, you have to believe in what you do and what you want to do. Love and belief have to go together with failure. Okay. Because any prophet came to earth or any messenger or any reformer, he loved the community and he believed in them and he wanted or she wanted to save them. Okay, so these two things should be with you. And third thing, you have to be closer to the people because the energy will come to your heart is from the heat of the love of the young children surrounding you. And when you go back, I tell you something, sister, uh, what's your name? Ragda. Ragad, Ragad is, is another Syrian or Palestinian? Ragad. Yeah, I'm originally Palestinian, living in Jordan. So whenever I feel down, when I was in Islamic relief, I used to go and visit the country, affected countries, and they come back super because I take the energy from their smiles, from their agony, so I can come to advocate for them. So there is no end for trying. And there is no end for meeting challenges, but you have to keep facing them. Two days ago, Sister Ragad and everybody in the room, we had the, the International General Assembly of Islamic Leave globally. And I was looking at the distances between the representative or the delegation in the meeting. Australia, the far east, America, in the far west, Sweden, in the far north, South Africa, in the far south. This happened after 37 or 38 years, 38 years of continuous strive and working collectively with others. When you sit in a room and you be surrounded by people all the time, the zone there is about two o'clock in the morning. Some of them is midday, some of them evening, some of them afternoon. And all of them are like you, want to find a solution for the problem. So the love and the belief and the closeness to the people who energize you. The field, like actually now, if you are a Palestinian and you are contacting Gaza, your energy will come from the heat of the love of the Gazan people. Because they live, they are stronger than myself, more patient than myself, having more perseverance than myself. And they're struggling for life and they're fighting life and the difficulties of life. 
when you come closer to them this will give you the heat of the energy which keep you going and letting you not to be upset when you fail why you don't fail i fail let us fail together failure is the first step of success if you recognize why you fail or why i fail then you build on it i failed my doctor of medicine a major failure very bad i was doing my phd which is called phd but it's for the doctor called md i failed it major one i failed i think in my first year in medical school and they were threatening my mother if i don't pass i'll go to the faculty of commerce but i passed then i failed in some subjects all the way even when i was proposing some young girls i was refused for a few times then alhamdulillah somebody accepted me so failure is there all the time but you keep trying that's why alhamdulillah i have my wife which is the best giving from allah to me and i have my children which now they are married inshallah don't give up don't give up see my finger <laughs> don't give up never give up okay thank yes. you doctor well thank you Rahad. um if i'm just to make a comment on this i think dr hani at so many times like when you are in the field and when you see how it's really catastrophic over there you know like big number of people are suffering and like everyone is trying to do something for them and I actually felt this when I was working at the Syrian refugee camps in Jordan because we are we are dealing with really very big number and the, the living conditions were really bad. However, I think one of the like key points to deal with the situation is just to believe in the process and to know that at some point all of this effort would actually have its outcome and, and would result in something that maybe even better than the, the, the ones that you are looking forward to. So I think believing in the process and the trusting the process is maybe uh, one way to think of it. Um, I think I saw Murad wanted to say something. Go ahead, Murad. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Rajan, so much. Thank you, Dr. Hani, for uh, being here with us. Um, it's really an honor to talk to you and to have you in this uh, call. So um, for me, um, I'm introduce myself just in two words maybe i come from medical field i'm pursuing my medical degree um so that's not kind of i have exams coming up so that's i don't know should i fail should i not <laughs> so that's not much of a um a worry actually but um i have worked actually in uh this not refugee camps but rather uh, low socioeconomic status people here in, in Malaysia. So they have this something called the Orang Asli, basically, the people of the jungles. And also we have some kind of Rohingya, Rohingya refugees, the Myanmaris. Um, the problem here is that um, they're not really recognized according by law. They're not refugees there. So there's either illegal or illegal. So it's really hard to get funding. It's really hard to advocate in terms of because when you're advocating, basically you're advocating for a lost cause, basically you're advocating for something that it is illegal by law. So maybe, um, maybe from your experience, do you know any like kind of countries that they don't really recognize refugees in their uh, constitutions? That's number one. Number two, I'm very much interested um, on what are you doing at the moment? Are you still a medical doctor or <laughs> you have no, no, pulled no. out from that specific field a long time ago? Yeah, I'm not a medical doctor anymore. I, uh, because I went to medicine to make my mother happy. And uh, then I went, I got my first degree from Al Azhar University in 1977, 77, 77. Then I traveled to UK and I got my Doctor of Medicine in 1991, which is the equivalent to PhD but for the medics. Then the Queen honored me uh, in 2004. Uh, then in 2007, I think, or seven, I think, uh, I was decorated as well by the university by another honorary degree, uh, honorary, what honorary degree, which doctorate, doctorate. So, but I'm not medical anymore. So I don't claim that I'm a medical anymore. So don't, don't to follow my track. That's number one. What was the first question? Um, with regards to 
you mentioned fat basically for fundraising advocacy and training so yeah. it's uh, basically it's just an advice for maybe startups yeah. Yeah. you know startups that's trying to actually initiate some kind of program but this program is rather it's really tough in that specific country so maybe from experience in are, are you malay but, or you are just uh, living there no no I am Libyan. I am living in Malaysia. I am pursuing my medical degree at the moment. I'm at my yeah. final years. So I've been to Libya many times and my second degree, my second degree was from Benghazi, from Shahada Yanair. Uh, are you from uh, Tripoli area or from the east? Yeah, I'm from the Tripoli area, yes. <laughs> Tripoli area. I know people there. I, be, I was there in 2011, 2012. Even a few years ago, I was there as well. I had a lot of friends in Libya. So if you look at Libya as a case study, uh, Libya is facing a يعني, difficult peace uh, area at the moment. We still people uh, from what, you call it, what, what I'm calling it, the deep states inside the Libyan uh, country, and the anti-revolution or the anti-freedom people who are trying to do uh, work to stop uh, reforming Libya. What you need to do, you need to focus on advocacy. Advocacy. If you are a humanitarian, you focus on the advocacy of the humanitarian situation of the people who are affected, like the Rohingya people or the people of the jungle. In the case of Malaysia, you have to partner with the local organization to take you as a volunteer. Because I know Islamic Leaf has an office in Malaysia and we opened it in 2002 and it's in Kuala Lumpur. And uh, Islamic Leaf is working with the Rohingya people and with the local people from the uh, jungle because they are registered in Malaysia. Okay? So my advice for you, advocacy is there uh, at the moment in Emirate. Okay? Okay. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's the Islamic Medical Association. Basically, it's it's been for a long time. Yes. So yeah. I am so, currently in it, and mashallah, it's it's growing. Yeah. So what I'm saying, if you are in a country like Malaysia, you have to partner with local organization, and they might fundraise through them. Okay. And this is this is something which is in in case of fundraising, in case of advocacy, nobody can stop you from sharing. Uh, articles, sharing uh, a photograph, images, uh, sharing videos to highlight uh, the issue of the people in uh, Libya or the people of Rohingya or the people of Uyghur and the other people of uh, the people. Even the, the poverty in India is, is, is phenomenal, unfortunately. So when you want to start a project, when you have no experience, okay, Project for all of us, brothers and sisters, starts an idea at the back of the mind of the individual. So uh, Murad, uh, Ragad, uh, Razan, and other sister, I can't remember her name, from India. Uh, maybe the, India, the, the, the idea came from India. And she called Murad and Ragad and Razan to sit down with her. I have this great idea and want to do something. So they help her to change her idea into a small project. Whenever you start as a startup, don't ever, you might think big, but you act local. In a way, you are not going to change the constitution of Malaysia tomorrow or to bring peace and tranquility to Libya tomorrow because still people are, holding, are carrying arms in their hands and tanks and others. But you are trying to uh, make something which could be tangible and being observed by the local community. Like if you want to do some project for education in an area in the middle of South Sudan, a lot of people need education. You have to find a small place to start with, a small number of, of young children, and you have to make it seen and tangible to the community so they can support you. So choose, choose a quick, uh, the, the philosophy of the quick impact project.
was the project which can work, make a quick impact. That actually it is tangible, people can see it, it is short, it's simple, and people can actually come and, 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 and help you in that. Don't actually say, I'm going to take over the whole of Tripoli as a big city because there's a big, big problem of displacement of people. It's too much for you. But you can talk about one street or two streets in Tripoli with five or 10 or 15 friends of yourself. Once you grow up, you can go from this to another level, to another level, to another level, through your experience and through your achievement and through your support. Your supporter. But if you, if you think from the very beginning, having no resources, like actually, to be very honest, when we started 1980, you know, the first donate, the first 1,000 pounds, just to make you happy now, the first 1,000 pounds that I received when I was, uh, even Islamic Leaf, was not called the Islamic Leaf yet, in uh, July, August 1983, I check, because we didn't have an office, didn't have a desk, didn't have a room, and we're opening, have a donation box, just a donation box in, in the community center. And when, when we opened this uh, donation box, there was one check from a doctor, medical doctor from Derna. You know Derna? Yes, you know Derna? yes, absolutely. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> the beautiful Derna. Uh, I love it because I've been there many times. And we were, me and my colleague was Palestinian as well, Palestinian Iraqi, where he was doing his PhD in chemistry and I was building my doctorate of medicine in medicine. That's 1,000 pounds. You know what? When I visited Libya and was touring Libya in, in March or April 2011, 2011, huh? 10 years ago, and I was delivering a talk in Derna. And I mentioned this story. I heard a woman in the, in the audience screaming when I mentioned his name, Abu Bakr Azuz. He said, my uncle. And everybody in the room was clapping for her uncle, which maybe 30 years before that, gave this 1,000 pounds, which was a big, big milestone for us. So grow small, steady, progressively, and keep collecting volunteers or friends or colleagues to believe in your idea. Then you prevent failure. This is what we have done with the Islamic League. No office, no resources, no budget, nothing. In the whole of maybe 20, uh, not 20, 1984, I think we raised my half by 5,000 pounds in the whole year, or 10,000 pounds. That's it, in the whole year. And I was legging it from door to door, from house to house, from mosque to mosque, from shop to shop, from and distributing leaflets. My wife was typing, you know, the typewriter? Are you still using typewriter? No, not anymore. My wife was using it. And my colleague's wife was actually doing the charity uh, work with the sister and raising funds for the orphans in Lebanon and the orphans in, in Palestine and other places. Start small. You grow big. Like the seed. The seed of the tree. How big it becomes in a few years' time. But young people like myself, not yourself, you're an old man. Young people like myself love to see the seed fruitful. It can be. The seed can become fruitful. The tree must become fruitful, but it takes its time. It takes its time, and it takes the careful protection of the farmer like yourself. If you have a good, bad farmer like myself, you'll have dead wood. In your garden. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hani. Just one more actually follow-up question. How about when you start to start small in a in a maybe in a place or in a constitution where um, maybe GOs, government organization, will start to attack? So are, how was your experience with backlash from government what do, agencies? What, what, what do you mean start to attack? I mean when you're starting to help some kind of in conflict zones, you're trying to help specific people. The yes. other part will start to attack in some kind of a backlash where you're you're just helping. I mean, uh, if you are in a no, if you are in a conflict zone, like the second, the case of Syria, like the case of Syria, for example, or the case of Yemen, for example. I don't advise uh, 
people who do not have organizations to go there. But if the local people would like to do that, they're welcome. But people like yourself and myself, because I remember in, 19, in 2012, one of the young people from a certain country was in a meeting in his own country, and they said they have crossed the border to go from Turkey to Syria. And in this meeting, there was somebody from the intelligence tell them, tell, told them it's an act of terrorism, and they put him on a terrorist list. And actually, there was a court case against him of a death sentence. But he, uh, he left the country, and now, uh, alhamdulillah, he's living in Turkey, and he is Turkish nowadays. So if you are a foreigner, and you try to do some voluntary activity in a conflict, an armed, armed conflict zone with a lot of proscribed groups. Don't touch it. Get the local community to do it. But you can do for them the advocacy, the media campaign, and the other things, actually. But you don't do it yourself because actually the law governing this conflict zone is different to the law covering uh, another zone which is actually suffering from poverty or drought or something else. But this area is full of intelligence, military, security, and a lot of watchdogs. My advice to you is to go through a credible organization and they can do the work on your behalf. But the local young people, the Syrian like Sister Razan or the Sister uh, Ragad in, in Gaza can do the work can do the work locally on your behalf. Clear? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, boss. You need to give me a sandwich, tuna sandwich. <laughs> With Harissa, with Harissa. <laughs> Harissa, not the, not the Syrian Harissa. Yeah, I Harissa know it. The Tunisian one, I know it. <laughs> oh, that's it. Yeah, you know it. It's a very yeah. hot one. Yeah, of course. The Libyan one, not the Tunisian one. Oh, okay, really? Fine, fine, Mr. Libyan. Fine. <laughs> um, well, Murad, following up on your questions, um, I will be sharing uh, the YouTube channel of Dr. Hani. I have been actually watching some of the videos over there. There are a lot of lectures on or webinars on humanitarian and civil work, on fundraising and so on. And some of them are on the skills of, uh, of someone who works uh, in the humanitarian field. So you can check it out. Um, it's, it's quite valuable and the, the content is really rich over there. Uh, we are heading towards the end of the session. Um, and so I would like to, to know if anyone else would have any input or would have any comment or any question, Wasun specifically, uh, if you'd like to have your own contribution or Iman, uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Razan. And thank you, Dr. Hani, for your very insightful uh, lecture. Most of the things that you discussed and followed by Razan and Murad, I relate to them the same issues because uh, although I'm an Indian by nationality, I'm less of an Indian because I was raised completely in Saudi Arabia. And then I did my university in Malaysia. And even working in, in Malaysia, it has been always the outsider. You rarely get to you know, do something that would last for long. I started this teaching program for Rohingya refugee children in 2016. And in 2018, when I had to leave, I was riddled with this doubt, which I still sometimes have, that what if, you know, you, something happens to this, who will be responsible for the cause that I started? So I was wondering, like, do you get those doubts or how do you battle those doubts? Like, I feel sometimes very burdened and anxious, and that stops me from doing my work better. I'm always, like, you know, obsessed with continuing that project because if I don't, then that burden of not providing education falls on me. So your responsibility are not responsible to what you ha happen to them after you leave them. But you are responsible for creating a stable, sustainable system and project to help them. A good leader like yourself, sister, uh, are you Iman or Fatima? Iman. Iman, Sister Iman, a good leader like you does not leave followers, leave leaders behind. So while you are there uh, doing your uh, study or helping the people in Malaysia, you have to find a handful of young 
girls and boys like and train them and connect them to the outside world if it happened that you leave malaysia afterwards you keep connecting with them to keep helping them okay and this is your effort because an effort of one man or one woman is what they can do allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said Allah does not ask you to do something that you cannot do or beyond your capability. Is that right? So for you, you should keep training people all the time while you are with them. Then when you leave them, you keep actually contacting with them and helping them and advising them. A lot of prophets came to say was sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and none and the, some of them that have no believers to believe in their mission and some of them have with the few to believe in them even the long-standing prophet called prophet uh, Nuh alayhi salam I think he not many people believed in his mission after 950 years of da'wah. Even the first group who believed and immigrated to Abyssinia or to Medina at the time of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were in, in all of them in one or 200 after nearly 12 years or 11 years of da'wah. Da'wah from whom? From the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So don't be disheartened of not finding a lot of people to be with you. I used to give a circle in the 90s. You know how many people used to come to me, Sister Fatima, Sister Iman? One or two. And they used to sit on the sofa sleeping till anybody comes and knock the door and said, yes, let us start. And once this man, his name was Omar, I'm not sure if he's still alive or dead, uh, his name was Harold, but I always called him Omar because as a, as a revert. When he come, he used to come, I used to wake up and give the class to him, to him. Him is one. So don't be disheartened of finding no support. Keep support as much as you can. Even let me give you another example. When uh, Allah uh, asked Prophet Abraham السلام, to go to Mecca and leave his wife and his suckling baby, Ismail, left her where? In the middle of a desert. No food, no drink, no water, nothing. And she asked them one question. Is this your decision or this is Allah's decision? Said Allah said, said, if it's Allah's decision, Allah will never uh, forget about us. And within few, uh, the, the going up and down between Safa and Marwa seven times, the water came from underneath the feet of Ismail alayhi salam. You know what Allah told Ibrahim alayhi salam? Add them for nas, make announcement. Announcement where? There's nobody there in the Arabian Peninsula. Nobody make announcements yeah, for Hajj. And people will be coming to you walking or uh, riding camel or donkeys or uh, horses to come to you from different corners of the globe. How? It's not your business to know how. It's your business to do it. As then, an order to make the announcement. Allah will let this Adan to reach the whole globe. So for you, Sister Iman, do the work and let Allah look at your heart, look at your intention and give you the strength to carry on the mission and make it successful. It doesn't have to be successful during life. It may be successful after I pass. Is it clear, Sister Iman? 
Yeah, thank you so much. That's actually I needed to hear this because just a few weeks ago I was like you said I had trained people, but out of the ten people I trained, there's only one person leading the entire project, and that so time what? I get this. I'm sorry. So you, you know, I want to deliver a talk. I believe in the one percent theory. If one individual out of a hundred understood or understand what I'm saying, that's more than enough for me. Because change yeah, maker. I believe in that. Like Allah will take care of it as long as you do it. Yeah. You... Because Sister Iman, change makers are not in thousands or in millions. There could be a few in one community. That's why Allah sent the prophets, one prophet. One prophet, mm -hmm. not prophets to, to one area. And the prophet collects people around them. Thank you, Doctor. I hope, inshallah, I keep up with this faith that Allah will take care. Because sometimes it makes it very confusing. Always revert to... Well, you can contact me. My contact is with Sister Razan, and she is my boss. Oh, definitely. I'll get your contact. And inshallah, if you're back in Malaysia, we will try to, you know, have some collaboration with Islamic Relief Fund. And the same thing with Murad, too. Inshallah. Inshallah. May Allah bless you, both of you. All of you. Thanks yes, a lot. I also, I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite shocked that you, mashallah, you know Islamic Association here in Malaysia. Have they haven't been working with Islamic Relief Fund because it's quite an old, old association, but I didn't know, mashallah, it was this international. You mean Islamic Relief? Uh, no, not Islamic Relief in UK, but Islamic Association here, organization here in Malaysia. I know quite a few of them, not all of them, but Islamic Relief has got a big office as well there. If you Google Islamic Relief Malaysia, you can speak Malay to them. Mashallah, we'll definitely look it up, inshallah. Inshallah. Well, um, thanks a lot, Dr. Hani. Um, I'm not going to make it any longer for you. Um, I just want to ask one final question if there is anyone who would like to contribute. Um, Please feel free to speak in Arabic or in English. Um, yeah, Kusun, do you have anything I to say? I can speak Arabic. I can speak Arabic. Uh, thank you very much, Raza. Dr. Hani, I mean, I'm not sure how to do it. Dr. Hani, I'm not sure how to do it. 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 هو حضرتك دكتور هاني رحمه الله عبد الرحمن السميت من مبدا ان الله اذا احب لا لا هو عبد الرحمن السميت في الاول عبد الرحمن السميت في الاول وانا وراه <تصفيق> بارك الله بكم انتم الاثنين لانه يعني فكره العطاء موهبه العطاء موهبه ربنا بيوهب لنا ناس يعني هو ربنا اذا احب عبد استخدمه في الخير وخير الناس انفعهم للناس فانا اليوم موجودة أهل بالمحاضرة لأنه مثل ما قلت لك أنت بالنسبة لي قدوة من زمان ودائما في العمل المجتمعي لا بالعكس القدوة ضرورة في الحياة يعني نحن إذا ما كان عنا قدوة نقتدي بهم ونسير على خطاهم على خطاهم يعني فبالعكس منضل مكاننا راوح منك بناخذ التجارب والأفكار شكرا كثير لك كلام قيم جدا شكرا لرزان شكرا لمراد وشكرا كثير لكم جزاك الله خير من الله بليس يو إن شاء الله جزاك الله خير شكرا كتير وجزاك الله خير دكتور هاني أرغد is is thanking you as well in the chat thanks a lot for your time and thanks for all of your contributions and stay safe everyone